And welcome to the Codex Cantina. We are here with a special video for you guys today. My name is Una. Not so special crypto. But our very special guest here. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Oh my god. It's like it's like we can almost give you like a, a digital wet willy here almost with the Willie. screen set up. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> Now, Sean, today is a very special moment for me because I don't know if you know this or not, but you, along with Brian from Bookish, are two of the first booktubers I ever watched. So I found out what booktube was through your videos as well as Brian from Bookish. It's great to have you on here and finally talk with well, you. I did not know that, and um, I think it's always good to find a booktuber to learn what not to do. So you, you chose <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, no, thank you. Thank you. This is kind of like an honor. Like we've, you know, watched you for many a year now. So it's kind of cool. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm delighted to be here and, and get a chance to chat with you guys live. This is for, you know, not live, but whatever. We're, we're chatting live. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm awestruck. Mm -hmm. Now, while I started my experience with you actually on Yoko Ogawa, I believe it was uh, with, with her uh, professor yes. video and, the, and yeah. housekeeper. Uh, today, we're here to talk about a 1901 Canadian classic, The Man from Glengarry by Ralph Connor. And I have a paper copy I can hold up. Yes, yes. And that was, this was brought to us through the page 112 challenge, where it you was. gave us three selections and said, hey, just read page 112. Do you like the writing? And we said we did. We said, hey, this looks like there's a lot of man from the past influence. You can see a lot of the religious elements of it. And you reached out to us and said, hey, um, would you guys be interested in reading some Canadian lit with me? You know, kind of read this, talk about, you know, how it landed upon us. And then we said, let's do it. Let's do it. So that's why we're here today. Here we are. And you've provided. Yeah, and disclaimer. Oh, oh. Go, go ahead. And disclaimer, uh, for me, I this might be like the first significant or. I don't know, real is the right word, uh, like Canadian author uh, that I can recall reading, um, you know, besides maybe something that was, you know, school required when I was a teenager or college. Like I, I was racking my brain and thinking, you know, Connor might be the first um, Canadian author that I've read for my choice or pleasure. So it's kind of fun to always, you know, get new experiences. So but thank you for that, too. Before I make my quip, I should say for those of your subscribers that don't know, I'm Canadian. So, that's, but now it's, I've kind of spoiled it. But now I'll say, "Oh, me too!" It's the first Canadian <laughs> novel I've ever read. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> no. So we decided to read this, and Sean, mm. you just pushed out a background video. So I will put a link down below where you talk a little bit for people like us, where you know, and and I, I don't want to speak for crypto's education. But, you know, when we go through world history, we don't spend a lot of time on the Canadian side of things. And it's kind of like it's it's reduced. Right. We, at least in my education back in the 80s, it was kind of well, Canadian was, you know, Canada was a lot like the U.S. where we headed west and we basically settled the land and, and took it and claimed it, basically. So you, one of your things was to say, OK. I don't think Ralph Connor is going to give me the indigenous experience or revelation, but I do want to see what was the settler mentality. So I kind of want to explore that along with you today. Um, and now you are Canadian, but I believe you're living in Japan, correct? I am indeed. Okay. Okay. So you'll have a very unique experience to share with us on that. Mm. Now, let's start out with basically kind of a one-line description. If you were put in the, 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 the hot seat here as you are, and said, what is your one or two sentence description of what is the man from Glengarry? What would you say? Um, the man from Glengarry is a man from Glengarry who, whose <laughs> life journey in, kind of embodies that settler mentality of, of exploring and taking over the land and, and uh, causing capitalism and Christianity to break out from coast to coast. Mm, mm, and a, Ooh, and how'd I do? Coast to coast, coast to coast Christianity. Didn't know that was going to be coming out today. And, Not and capitalism. Coast, I, I love that. It certainly is a capitalist note. Yeah, now, wasn't it really? Yeah. Now I would, so, I would say, I, yeah. I, I would love to hear 
your experience, Sean, because I did a little bit of like, you know, Googling and research online of, you know, you shared with us how he sold like hotcakes back in the day, you know, 1901 was when this was published. And today I went to the LibriVox where you can listen for free. And in the past four years, it had only been downloaded 50 times. And one of them was me. Yeah, and, and one of them was me, right? <laughs> okay. So well, yeah, it was us. So so not many people are exploring his works today, right? No. So he he went from famed to f- what fail? I don't want to say failure. Famine. Yeah, famine. Well, he's he's just disappeared into the into the dustbin of history. Right. Um, I would say, and in his day, he was outselling exponentially outselling Anne of Green Gables. And wow. That, and that's crazy. Wow. Nobody knows who he is yeah. today, it seems. Because I look online and there's not much conversation. But I did see a couple of schools where the students would say, hey, I saw a bit of myself and my past in this book. Yep. The Gaelic phrasing, you know, mm. some of the things that my father or grandfather would say, I can see happen in this book. What was your experience with how the book came across to you? Um. I, f- I found that it really dragged. There was some things that were uh, interesting enough that I'm glad I read it, but it was a bit of a it was a bit of a drudgery reading experience. Large chunks of it, the Christianity of it, just <laughs> it was. Uh, and the literary cris- the literary criticism I found said this is the only one of his that has any literary value. And I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm certain you're not going to pay me to read any of the other ones. <laughs> Now, this is a book that I thought was kind of like, it it felt like there's a lot of different ways to describe this book, because you had the the didactic religious element to it. You had the romantic element of it. And then in the last third quarter, I don't know if I want to say a turn, but the amount of nationalism talk and the amount Mm -hmm. of uh, you know, what we used to call, you know, man with manifest destiny, go West, conquer land resources. Like it really took over in the end. So, so it's hard for me to kind of describe the book because it's just like, there's like almost like three different types of novels in this. It felt like. Mm. Sure. Yeah, I, I and then, that. yeah. And then I felt like there was this subplot of the love story in there as well. So you have all of these big themes and then he's trying to sneak in this, you know, uh, young man's almost hero journey, but not really more like a love tale of how he has to get over his high school crush to put it in modern terms and finally try to have a life with his college girlfriend. It's kind of how I felt Mm. as well. That was very off putting at times. Like you cared about it, but then there are times you're like, just get me through to the meat and potatoes. I'm tired of this sub genre romanticism. Yeah, I I just don't think he's really good at uh, creating. I didn't see any real evidence in this novel of him doing really kind of subtle, nuanced character work. The characters were pretty black or pretty white. Mm-hmm. Maybe Mamie's the only one where where there was a little bit of nuance there, and that is for better or worse. But <laughs> I, I liked the children so i liked ranald or i thought that the ranald is a very young man was quite well drawn and then was it huey the the minister and his wife's son uh, they, they kind of jumped off the page compared to anybody else but as ronald got older it wasn't that i disliked him i just didn't feel he was as interesting a character he just became too pure he, he became um a little bit more of a character of this is what i think the Canadian nationalistic man ought to be, yeah. you know, in the beginning coming of age, almost kind of like exalts it a little bit. And I'm not trying to put it down, but it doesn't feel so much like a coming of age because I don't think there was really, it, it didn't come across as a big revelation of I'm like, Oh, this really explains some part of the human experience to me. It felt more like uh, a justification, if you will, mm-hmm. with the way it was written. Uh, how how would you say you felt going from beginning Ranald to end Ranald when it got real nationalistic on you at the end there? Well, I found the ending uh, probably one of the more interesting sections. Okay. I um, I don't mean that it was well done, but it was really interesting because I have been boning up on Canadian history because, you know, what do Canadians know about their own history? Very little. We're not very patriotic people. But with all this <laughs> 
going on. You can edit it out if you want. But with all the crap going on in Canada of, with indigenous rights and the fact of indigenous oppression coming to the fore, I have been doing a deep dive comparatively mm. for, compared to anything any other time in my life into all of that murky history. Um, and so seeing our our racist prick of a founding prime minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, as a literary character, and seeing what got left out of that narrative, that was fascinating. So mm. um, I don't think it was... Do you think, bad, but do you think Connor had uh, a ulterior motive or agenda, or we've talked about some other authors that have to write very cautiously about their own leaders for fear of retribution. Do you think Connor is doing this, even though it's been, uh, you know, centuries later, it, it, he still has to kind of walk that fine line of upsetting his own fans or, you know, his own constituents, his fellow Canadians, um, where, you know, in 2021, when you're reading this, they're all long dead. And so you can reflect upon it without any bias. Yeah. How do you feel about Connor writing the way that he does? So I just checked because I didn't know, but uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada, he'd been dead 10 years when this was published, and he had gone been out of office since, is that right, 1873. So when this novel was published, he was ancient history politically, but... Um, Decade, not century, okay. Not a century, but but yeah, he was, okay. he was off the scene, and I don't know what people thought of him uh, a decade after his death, uh, but he's certainly reviled by anybody who isn't a right-wing in Canada today. Um, what I think the project was, was it was this messianic, is that too strong? No, I think messianic zeal that this Christian fiction, which, this Christian fiction, which was that the, there was uh, a manifest destiny, but God's God's will to to tame the West, and that was McDonald achieved that. And there's a lot at the end about getting British Columbia to join because they didn't weren't part of the they weren't some of the original colonies that became Canada in 1867, but they joined four years later, and because of the promise to put the the railway across, and. Um, there was a kind of Christian mission aspect to all of that. So, Just one quick follow-up question. So because one thing is, is that Ralph O'Connor is his uh, Ralph pen Connor. name. Ralph Connor. Ralph Connor. Excuse me. Ra Ralph Connor is his pen name. Uh, you know, his, his real name is Charles Gordon. Do you think that it plays into this specific book that he's trying to separate kind of the political from the religion being that he was a, a reverend uh, and minister. Well, maybe he thought I, he was, but oh my God, I wish he tried a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, that was a loaded question. I, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, oh it's God. very obvious, but... Uh, uh, yeah, so maybe in his day, that would have been considered kind of secular. Yeah. To it seems like he tries to split it in the, you know, the, the pieces of the book, as Una was pointing out, but... I hate to say, kind of failing miserably at times. Yeah. I mean, that might be a harsh criticism, but it it is there. Yeah, no, this this I, I'm being generous. I would give it a three star rating. You know, on Goodreads. Out of ten. Yeah, five out of five. five. Oh, out of five. Well, yeah. That's not too bad. Well, for me, it's, it means it's a bad book that I didn't like. So I'm my three star is lower rating than other people. So. But oh, okay. uh, but I'm glad I read it. There were parts of it I thought even there was some lively writing in places, and I enjoyed learning about the Glengarry Highlanders, those Sc uh, Scottish settlers, and some of their uh, Gaelic and some of their traditions, and all the clearing of the forest and all that stuff. The, the, there was some interesting stuff that I googled as I was reading. It wasn't a waste of my time, but it was it was not a, a completely successful reading experience. What would you say about Mrs. Murray? Um, I think she wanted to jump Ranald's bones. <laughs> <laughs> she was um, an interesting character. I felt like Connor put her put her in there almost as himself, like a a way to get his thoughts into the book, into the characters a way for him to judge characters. Like she was kind of the moral compass, 
I felt like for the novel. She was, and and compared to other of the religious stuff going on, she, there was a little bit of nuance to her. She was quite attractive to me when Randall was young. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being a, I'm being a little bit, I'm joking a little bit, but I actually think that she was quite attracted to Randall. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, maybe that's just a stand that, for, for the reader. That like what is a a reverse Oedipus kind of complex thing going on? That I kind of had that vibe a little bit too in the beginning, and then it it waned away as you realize that she really was just trying to be a mother figure and have a, a an influence on his life that you know maybe she didn't have that exact relationship with her own son, but she could have the relationship with this young man. And her own son was very young, but it didn't seem like that um, her husband was all that interesting of a husband. He's gone a lot, too, I thought. He's gone a lot. And much is made of her working herself, with all her volunteer work and Sunday school teaching and this, that, and the other thing, all, all of that, that she is almost dropping dead from everything, and she just go, go, go. And, and that was seemed to be exalted in the novel rather than problematized. And I knew I, from doing some of the research that's in the background or video that the the gender stereotypes holy smokes yeah and she was she was as pure as the driven snow oh yeah oh yeah she was couldn't 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 have any fallibility from like a sensibility of the time perspective and i think that goes to what you guys were talking about earlier perhaps this narrative was and i don't mean the story's narrative but the narrative of culturally and religion of what's expected was more accepted back then and we look mm. at it probably a little bit more different now one of the things when I was looking at Mrs. Murray was I was, I don't I don't think Crypto fully agrees with me on this one, but it got a little Aaron Brockovich at the end with the people aren't getting paid, so we're gonna send her in and talk to all these lawyers, and she's gonna single handedly convince everyone about what the right thing to do and business acumen is. It got like she she was expected to be so perfect that they were putting in these situations where I'm like. Well, I, one, I'm not sure she's like the best source to, to come talk to people about that. But but two, would they allow that, right? I mean, this is early 20th century. Um, uh, I think the story is actually set uh, from about 1860 to 1870. The, the writing of it, I'm saying, though, right? So even the, right, the writing, yes, yes, yes. So even in the writing time frame, though, like I, I don't know if if we would just put a minister's wife in front of a shareholder to talk about minimum wages and such. Is, is, am I way off on that one? He's the Canadian Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> I would say there's moments like that where I'm just kind of like, mm, I don't know if this aged the well, aged so well, right. the best for me. Right. I think it could have been left that she had a profound influence on Ranald and she could have been left that, that, that he went ahead and, in implemented some of those things without her, like you say, uh, that was a little bit of a ridiculous uh, scene. I, I do, I do agree with you in a regard that stereotypically the way that she is portrayed is, is not realistic at the time period. Uh, you know, and I think that she comes across as, I guess, what we would call a modern Mary Sue. It, and I, I think that. Um, she's the, you know, can do everything, you know, I love my star Wars reference. She's like Ray, like she can do all of it. And it just feels a little mm -hmm. bit unrealistic for the time period of that. She's almost the main character, arguably that is facilitating all this or, or she's the puppet master that is weaving the whole narrative together between the Canadian government and Ronald and her son, her husband, the two love interests, the the wilderness company, the Glengarry boys themselves. Like she has her hand in all the pies. And that's just it's very unrealistic. Like she's the mob boss almost. Mm -hmm. So that that was, I guess, just yeah, it, it felt unrealistic. It, it felt like wishful writing to me that, you know, if if he was a minister. Right, like we, we talked about in his background. And he experienced things like this is what I want for Canada, you know, in terms of, of British Columbia, in terms of the railway, uh, in terms of people just showing up at church. Like, how much of this novel were 
why didn't you go to church this Sunday? Where have you been? And when you come around or when we show compassion to Le Noir and all of a sudden he sees compassion as the way to, you know, to, to belief. Uh, it was very wishful writing of, he's like, here's things that I see as problems with people. So I'm going to inject them into this novel. So it felt very, I think some people might say didactic. And I think that, I think that would really appeal to the reading public in that era. Yeah. Right. The, what were the ninety percent very very religious went to church every Sunday? So this kind of novel would really speak to them. But oh my god, <laughs> landing upon matter. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for how you're expressing yourself, three sounds generous to me. I, it well, almost sounds I, like I you. Reserve, I reserve the right Two. to change my mind. Um, I've got time whenever this video goes live, that's when I will come out of the closet as having read it and given a given, did I just say come out of the closet? <laughs> Where did that come from? Um, uh, and, and ascribe, uh, you know, assign a, a rating to it. But uh, I, I think there was enough in it that held my interest that, yeah, three, I didn't hate it. Yeah. For, for me, so, the, the beginning was more engaging actually. It was. And, and then when we got to, how the characters viewed the future of Canada resources. Uh, it was very blatantly like it was aware they were taking land from, from the local indigenous folk. Like there was racist comments in there, depending on, you know, your reading taste out there. If you're listening to this, there are clearly moments of expressed racism that can be hard to read that, yeah. uh, I wouldn't say it changed my mind on some things. Um, and there's almost no reference to indigenous people. I think I, I highlighted one or two, but they were so passing that almost forgettable. But the interesting thing for me um, in terms of vocabulary was the logging stuff, or not, they were, a lot of these characters were lumberjacks, but they were also clearing the forest around their farm or whatever. What was that called? Bru Brule. Mm. Yeah. And... I, when I saw the first few references to brulee, I thought they were talking about um, indigenous peoples because the brulee du bois was the early name for the Métis people. And Métis people is a kind of singularly Canadian um, uh, indigenous nation, which is uh, grew out of the marriages between the um, indigenous fur traders and the French fur traders hundreds of years ago and then they just formed a really distinct group and Métis means mixed race but the early name for them was the Bois de Brûlée and Brûlée means burnt wood okay so so um it it, it was uh, their skin was darker than sure. a white guy's sure. but in this novel Brûlée is about the burnt logs and the tree stumps that they're pulling out and so it took me a long time to realize, oh, they're actually, they're not talking about Métis. They're Maybe, about actually, I think, I mean, because I, I'm learning new stuff here, and that's, again, why I'm glad we had you on. Do you think, I mean, analytically, this could be a way that he is portraying them pulling out the indigenous people from their lands? That you is know, using a little bit of imagery there, right? I mean, the burnt tree burnt person the exact same word and they're pulling or ripping them from their homes it seems to be spot on that is freaking brilliant i didn't think that damn it i didn't think of that but um <laughs> I, I think we i i think in my mind i would separate it from what the author's intention was but that reading of this book is fabulous i love it well i mean For, and oh. that's one thing that that, Una, that Una and i talk about all the time is whether it was his intention or not that's the way once it gets into my brain i'm allowed to digest it oh, and i, I think you kind of hit onto something there that, so that, maybe there is a little bit more to it than what he intended but taking it in 2021 i think is, is very plausible there's a there's a there's an argument to be made there oh sure i i, I think we would be um we need to take a shower if we had access to his diary <laughs> what, he, what he felt about india the native Canadians, the indigenous population in that day. I mean, even, you know, now in Western Canada, the, the typical, the racism against indigenous peoples is just disgusting. So just go back a hundred years. He, he must've been a, a, you know, terrible racist. Um, I, I shouldn't say that, but there's nobody to sue me. So I just did. Um, 
but the, that reading of this text, I think, is is really fascinating. Yeah. Well, from his background, I mean, he's from Eastern Canada, writing about Western Canada. And then that's sometimes like to compare it to the United States is like a northerner writing about a southerner or vice versa. Sometimes some stuff gets lost there because of your upbringing, right? And um, I double checked to, to to match the chronology of his life to the the publication of this book. So by 1901, he had been living in the West for about well over 10 years, and he was in Winnipeg. So okay. it's really interesting that um, he didn't write about anything. I think in some of his other novels, which we are not going to buddy read, by the way, but in some of his other novels, he wrote about uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. I'm from Saskatchewan, but. Um, in this novel, he goes all the way to British Columbia. So yeah, that was interesting. All right. So we are moving towards the end of the chat. We're going to move into our subjective wrap up and ratings. Um, I think Sean kind of kicked us off with a little bit of the three out of five. Mr. Crypto, let's start with you. What are you going to give this book and would you recommend it or who would you recommend it to if so? So sometimes I give a rating out of 10 on our scale of multiple ratings for um analytical value and personal enjoyment. And I kind of want to give two different scores sometimes like this time. And for me, um, analytically, I'm going to give this one maybe like five and a half and six, five and a half and six, because there is some interesting themes here with the history of Canada. There's the religious aspect, capitalism. There's some good stuff there. Um, it's not written that's very accessible, I think, unless you know a lot of it or have, you know, an awesome expert to help you out with. Um, but personally, it, and I, I hate to use this word, but it's a slog to get through at certain points in time, just my personal opinion. Um, and sometimes I felt like I was in church again. And when you're sitting down to read for pleasure and suddenly you're in a, a ministry that can pull you out of the story itself. Um, so on a personal enjoyment level, I'm probably going to give it like a four. Um, so kind of, kind of knock it down there. So yeah, somewhere, somewhere in between, really depending on what you're looking to get out of this book. I would not recommend this unless you are doing a deep dive into Canadian history and westward expansion of Canada to look at a fictional writing of how that might have occurred, you know, back in the, uh, the 19th century. Um, I would just say that I would recommend it to somebody who is studying Canadian history or studying Canadian literature, has some, some uh, ridiculously obsessive interest in those topics. As a um, di uh, as an autodidact, but otherwise, I would just steer clear. For me, I would say that I'm not the best person to say who to recommend it to. I, I was interested to see how Canadian lit students were seeing some of their past or heritage in it. A as an outsider, it was hard for me to pull that out. I, I would love to have you know seen a little bit more. I had to do a little bit of digging and research, but it was still a little difficult to understand what exactly was representative of the time. And some of the differences. So this would be a piece actually, you know, as, as crypto was saying that it's good to probably read with someone that can kind of explain that stuff, like how you've been able to pull out some of the, the history and heritage of it. Uh, it helps me to understand it a little bit more. So I'm probably not the best person to know who to recommend this to. Um, so as a person that is just kind of reading it for fun, I would say on the like the good read scale, two out of five for me, it just didn't really hit home for a lot of the different elements. Um, and I don't think it necessarily stood up the test of time for me to enjoy it. So, so maybe maybe um, the way to wrap this up is uh, I think we can all agree. Read page one hundred and twelve and skip the rest. <laughs> <laughs> what, what we saw, Indeed. what we saw in one twelve was there, right? The, the, the how the past influences the present, the the religious elements, and the need of duty. We got all of that. Just one hundred and eleven. Well, not 111, but <laughs> how many pages was this? Like 200 pages? So, uh, maybe, maybe 200 exactly, I think. Yeah, a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, I did it on uh, ebook. I have the audio, but I uh, I have the paper copy, but I didn't read it. The print's too small for my aging eyes. 280 pages, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, all right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in again. Check out Sean's channel with the Wet Willie over here. Uh, check out his Before You Read video if you haven't read it already for the background info on this. We appreciate you guys spending some time. Una out. It's been a delight. Peace.